looks like we are alive. 30 minutes past sharp. Um, I am Stefania Olofsdottir. You can call me Steph. I am the CEO and co-founder of AVO, and I am very honored to be here with you all today. Major kudos to Lindsay and Dexter and Itai and Sarah and the entire crew for organizing this incredible fest, the Modern Data Stack Fest. Um, so this is, I think, the second time in a row uh, and uh, that I'm joining, and I think that that makes me a uh, 100% uh, conversion rate as a, a speaker on this festival, which is fantastic and fun. And I am here to talk to you about maturing data cultures and uh, how we go from winging it to self-serve governance of data and data quality. So um, before moving on to that, just quickly, um, like I said, I'm the CEO and co-founder of AVO. Um, and AVO helps teams find, fix, and prevent data quality issues upstream where they should be fixed. And this talk is a little bit about exactly why that's the case and how we can get there and how actually culture and collaboration is a really fundamental piece in that journey. Um, Avo's mission is to inspire better data cultures so that teams can build better user experiences. And how we got to this place, a quick intro of myself. Um, I am Stefania, like I said, I have been in data science for 13 years or so, or more-ish. Um, and I started in genetics where I was doing data engineering and building data products, uh, actually bash scripts for biologists and doctors to uh, query genetics data and figure out whether there was a correlation between a DNA mutation and a physical trait. And that was when I learned to program and got into sort of data at scale. Uh, from there, I joined a mobile game called QuizUp as that blew up and reached uh, a million users in their first five days, which was the fastest growing app in the App Store at the time. And I got the opportunity and honor to be the data leader there to build up the, or be the first data person even, and build up the team and the infrastructure and the culture. And um, from there, of course, a lot of learnings um, came. And that's sort of the real origin story of how AVO came to be. Um, we solved data quality problems internally at QuizUp very painfully through by building them, tools and processes uh, over a three-year period. And um, it was it was it really changed everything for us. Um, so it was a, it was both a tooling solution, but also a cultural shift, of course. And those go very hand in hand. You sort of need both um, at the same time. And so um, a lot of learnings from those. And then fast forward a couple of years later, I started another company and had the exact same problem at that organization. Um, where we were struggling with data quality of our product data, trying to make decisions about um, go-to-market strategy and product strategy based on user retention and user conversions and things like that. Um, and it is just a real problem, but it's very hidden, uh, but it's very top of mind for everyone today. Um, and so I'm gonna just start with, what I like to do is sort of start with painting a picture and a, a, by telling a story, a story of a, of a this really ha honestly happened at that company that I started with a couple of friends from QuizUp before we moved on to actually deciding to build AVO um, after having talked to hundreds of product managers and developers and data scientists around the world and finding out that they were all equally miserable <laughs> to what, uh, to how we felt at QuizUp and at Visca. Um, and even those those tiny group of people, uh, a percentage or so, that had ended up building tools internally like we did, were still miserable because it was like a hot potato that nobody really wanted to maintain. Um, and it's difficult to integrate custom systems to everything else that you have in your systems and things like that. Anyway, so the real trigger, this was like a, this is, I, I probably should say trigger warning because this is what happened. Uh, 
um, uh, well, this is sort of what uh, the data looked like at Quizup, a quick anecdotal sort of overview. And this is the problem that we're talking about here. I'm sure some people are going to get goosebumps when they see this because this sounds and looks very familiar. And I think we're actually producing some merch for AVO right now that um, is in this direction. So if anyone's interested in that kind of merch, <laughs> let me know if you want to get trigger warned every time you use your tote bag or notebook. Um, uh, anyway, so this is the mayhem that I joined uh, at QuizUp and it took a long time of cleaning this app and a really long time of patching data downstream before we realized that we would really have to attack the problem upstream before um, actually going to a, getting to a better world. Um, and so, like I said, this is, this is then, then we went over to uh, another company and this here is a real story of what happened there. We were optimizing our onboarding conversion. So this is a use case. How do you use this kind of a data? Uh, how, how do you use this kind of data? And why is it really bad when it is wrong? What does it impact? Um, that's sort of the purpose of this anecdote here. So we noticed that 98% of our users were using the email uh, sign-up method. Um, uh, I see some people are excited about the tote bag and the merch. So uh, look forward to talking about that. So 98% of our users were using the email sign-up method. Um, and only 2% were using the phone number sign-up method in the onboarding funnel. And we were interested in optimizing that journey. And so we decided to simplify that and just like cut to the chase, input your email. You don't have to choose anything. Um, and we spent a bit of time on simplifying that journey. And then what we saw was that uh, the sign-up conversion, after we removed the phone number sign-up method, went from 81% to 46%. Uh, <laughs> that's like a, you know, that's a, that's a big jump. Um, and this is for a, you know, this was for a small startup, but this is happening all over the world in large enterprises and big companies. And then we're talking about that 0.1% change actually impacts, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of, uh, and tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. So when we saw this, obviously the data skeptic in me was like, what, the hell happened? Is the data broken or was it broken when we made this decision, right? Uh, and I'm sure a lot of people in this call uh, or in this talk, will that will resonate with them. When you see something like this, you assume something is broken. But it turned out that this conversion funnel actually dropped like this, but the data that we used to make the decision uh, was broken. So it turned out that we didn't actually have 98% of people using the email phone number. Uh, and 2% using the phone number, uh, uh, sorry, the e email sign-up method and 2% using the phone number sign-up method, we actually had a bunch of people that had triggered data points our way with phone number. I have shared this story in other settings before, but it's just always such a good example of um, I know a lot of people have had this happen to them. You've, you see this in your data and you see there's a tiny typo there and it's, it's, it seems so small, you know, it seems so small, but when you use it to make big decisions like updating your onboarding conversion funnel or um, changing something about checkout flows or something like that, and then it turns out that it's wrong, it can have huge, huge impacts. So how does a tiny typo impact uh, companies? Obviously, you make you can make incorrect product decisions or go-to-market decisions. Um, you spend weeks on implementing the incorrect product direction based on the incorrect product decision, or months in the um, occurrence of like a, a large, larger organization, for example. Then you have to spend more work on reversing the change when you find out that you made something incorrect. And obviously, in the meantime, you have a severe hit to your sign-up conversion, which could be a major hit to your actual revenue goals. And so I just want to remind ourselves, I know this isn't new information to most people here, but this is a reminder to how a tiny typo like this can really impact the company outcome, the bottom line. And that's really frustrating. And the problem about this is this, this getting that typo, preventing that typo is 
a huge problem and it's very hidden and the business stakeholders typically don't know how um, delicate that problem is. So our job is to make it easy for you to prevent it um, and make the case for why it's important to invest in that journey. Um, how does this happen? Just a quick recap on what does it look like to actually generate data for product releases, right? So you start with um, some sort of a, a product uh, sort of change and the product manager makes a change somewhere in a, in a Figma file or a, or a pitch doc in Google or something like that. From there, someone defines metrics and event structures and they use a Google sheet or an Airtable, maybe a JSON file or YAML, like Lindsay was talking about earlier today, or just ping someone on Slack and be like, hey, can you track the onboarding journey, you know? Uh, from there, you get some feedback and request implementation. That conversation often is taken completely out of context with the original suggestion or occurs in like a cell comment on a Google Sheet or something. Very typically, at least, some change in the original specification occurs in a conversation that doesn't get mapped out in the actual specification. Um, then someone goes ahead and implements in code and you end up with all of these variations of the events because you don't know what exactly exists already um, or because a decision was changed here after it was documented things like that uh, after it was originally documented and then you go into verifying that the implementation actually matches your specification and then typically what you do is you wait for your data to flow into your tool some sort of a midstream or downstream tool and you use your human eyes to verify it or you have some sort of a rudimentary ver verification in place human eyes aren't really good at catching things like this but this is very typically what's happening and people are even using like charge proxy or or just looking at the looking at the network um, tab in your browser to confirm that the data actually matches what actually should be triggered in the code this is error prone, but you typically catch something during this process. And at that point, you have to sort of beg developers to go back and um, fix whatever uh, whatever implementation they ended up making. That's painful. It's painful to have to make that beg. And often also it's too late because you sort of actually just jump into the process of verifying and QAing your data while uh, everyone else on the product team has actually left and gone on to do something completely different. <laughs> like the product is actually just ready to go out and you're sort of trying to stop it and delay it. And that's a really difficult position to be in as a data person. Typically the product manager does not want it to happen and they're willing to sacrifice it temporarily. That means the data won't be fixed ever. So it's a really delicate and difficult problem. And then of course you just continue the cycle, you ship your data or you ship your product and your data end up, ends up in your production databases. Um, and you use it to make incorrect product decisions. So this is how that happens. And it's a really delicate process and a very hidden process. A lot of people have no insights into how delicate this process is, unfortunately. Um, but I'm here to uh, advocate for us making it a cross-functional team sport um, and bringing on the right tools and processes so it's actually streamlined and simple. So let's talk a little bit about maturing data cultures and getting from this state or the journey actually to this state and then graduating beyond it. Um, so we have this evolution. We are sort of uh, in the winging it phase, in the absolute beginning. We have just someone is building a product and obviously the first thing they do is just ship code that gets a product live to the world. The first thing is not necessarily implementing analytics for it. And this is then true for the first, you know, a little bit of a time in the beginning, at least. Um, you're just in, in winging it. You trust your gut feeling for a while. Um, then you start realizing you need some insights to be able to make decisions at scale. So you start collecting some data, analytics events into your databases or into your analytics event tools like uh, mixed panel or amplitude or segment or uh, and particle or uh, post hog or etc. cetera. Uh, except every team is sort of running on their own and you end up with sort of a wild west of the crazy amount of uh, analytics events that I showed you in the beginning. And then each one of those has like a crazy amount of different types of properties uh, representing the same thing. And it's a, it's a wild west. So because then in the wild west, you have teams making terrible, terrible decisions based on that, you migrate into centralized governance. Uh, often called also in the, and I'll talk about the data mesh principles in a minute, in that it's called federated governance. Um, so you try to stop product teams from shipping bad data. 
And that comes at a cost. And I'm going to talk more about that later. And it's very painful. And that sort of causes actually those teams to not want to comply to your centralized governance and try to bypass the processes that you build because they're not efficient. But there is a way to actually get even further if you build the right processes and tools. So you graduate to a self-serve governance uh, state where you actually get good data and you get it fast. So you're not ending up with bad data and you're not ending up with it getting it slow. You enable the product teams or the domain owners as the data mesh principles talk about them as um, to actually define their data, but you have guardrails to help them. So let's look at this a little bit in the context of the data max principles. Um, so if you look at winging it, obviously that's not going to fulfill any of the data mesh principles. You go to the wild west, you sort of have domains, product teams, or you know the marketing team or the finance team or someone, they own their own data. Uh, I put it under construction, not a completely green check mark because there's not really even a process for them. So they're not necessarily even treating their own data as a product. So it's, you know, do they own it? I don't know. Um, definitely organization is not treating your data as a product and to evolve yourself in the journey of treating your data as a product, I really recommend as an analyst, as a data scientist, read books like Marty Kagan's Inspired and really think about what does it take to build great products and then treat your data like that um, and read books like The Mom Test and use that uh, those product building capabilities to actually interview your stakeholders to figure out what does it take to build good data products. And then obviously, of course, we're trying to build towards a self-serve data platform. And in the Wild West, we... Um, probably have the domain teams trying to, to self-serve themselves in the platforms that they're sending, but obviously they don't have reliable access or um, insights into what any other domains on the company is doing. And they definitely don't trust it because they don't understand where it comes from or what it means. Um, and of course we have no federated governance. Okay, let's move over to centralized governance and probably everything here really should be under construction uh, because arguably we haven't really reached this stage because it's really difficult to, to treat data as a product if we don't allow domain teams to own their own data, because ultimately in that case, they're completely blocked. They can't ship their products, their, their, uh, the, the, the sort of company product updates um, without relying on the centralized data governance team. And that's a really difficult position to be in. Um, but we're aiming towards a self-serve data platform. We're aiming towards treating our data as a product, and we are trying to enforce a federated um, governance um, at the expense of domain-oriented ownership. And it's really painful, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about why it's painful and how we can get there, the problems of it. Um, because ultimately, we really want to get here. And uh, I, I want to say that um, today's talk and what I'm talking about is shedding lights on how we really get from here to here and what are the things that we actually really need to solve. But I want to also call out that most organizations that I work with and that I've worked with in my lifetime, they also span the entire um, range. There's no one perfectly here. Um, and so don't set unexpected or unrealistic standards for yourselves, even though you have high aspirations. Um, the problems with upstream data governance at scale which is what you really need if you want to reach self-serve uh, data governance and sort of really fulfill the data mesh principles is you are stuck uh, at forever patching up bad data. Um, or, sorry, if we actually skip the upstream part here, this is just supposed to be the problems with data governance at scale. You are really forever stuck patching up bad data um, because you never really are able to get to fixing the data upstream, but you really need to get to there. Um, the central governance teams, like I talked about when comparing these uh, states to the data mesh principles, they become these really terrible human bottlenecks. They don't want to be those bottlenecks and uh, the teams don't want them to be the bottlenecks for themselves. There's a grueling amount of coordination that is required when you're trying to roll out global standards. Um, where do you document it? How do you ensure adoption of that? How do you ensure monitoring that people are actually fulfilling the standards? All of those things. And uh, there are these global needs that sort of 
conflict with domain independence. And this is a, a sort of a constant battle um, where one side typically needs to be sacrificing. And um, that's what's frustrating and that's really what prevents upstream data governance at scale. Um, the plan of action to get there, uh, we really need to get from the state uh, forever patching up bad data, global uh, needs conflicting with domain independence, grueling co coordination, and central governance teams uh, being human bottlenecks. And how we need to do this is we need to make data design a part of the product release cycle. So this is the part about moving data quality upstream, moving data governance upstream. Um, what that means is there is, um, uh, as part of the product release cycle, the definition of the goal of the release and the definition of the metrics for success of the release and the definitions of the events or the data points that you need for those metrics to be able to visualize those, you really need to sort of foster a culture where the product teams and the domain teams own that. Um, and that's a journey to go. And I've spoken about that on a lot of uh, previous occasions and we have some blog posts about that. Um, for example, if you Google um, AVO tracking the right product metrics or the purpose meeting, um, you'll find some resources on how I recommend generally um, building that type of a culture with also the right tools and processes in place, uh, team by team. And that's always about starting small. So find an ally somewhere, find a data curious product manager and a data curious uh, product engineer that really want to be making better product decisions. Um, find those people and build um, this case study internally with them, trying to make data design a part of the product release cycle. And then what we need to do is we need to have a data design system that is flexible, but rigid where it needs to be. So you need to have some sort of a, uh, an ability to govern what kind of data structures are allowed. For example, all our analytics events should be named with an object action format. And all our analytics events should be named in a snake case format. And all our properties should, you know, and you, ha you, you have these standards that you can enforce. And then you can take it even for further and say like, uh, only uh, these sets of objects are allowed to describe the product or the product actions. And only these types of actions are allowed to describe the product actions. And for example, uh, at your organization or at Quizza, for example, we had, uh, we never wanted any analytics event to refer to a match. We decided that they would always use the word game. So these are just small guardrails where you want your data design system to be rigid like this, but um, you need it to be flexible uh, in the sense that everyone can still create their own without having to go through you. Um, and so that's the sort of system that you want to build towards and the process that you want to build towards. Um, and having said that, going through this change, in my experience, uh, always requires stopping by a little bit in the centralized governance. So you're trying to build an organization that has federated governance by enabling uh, sort of domain ownership um, with guardrails. That's ultimately the culture that you're trying to do because it's really important to think about the thing that, or, or th to, to, to keep in mind that you won't be able to build this adoption uh, with, and this brings me to this, um, data, you, you want data design standards that anyone can easily adhere to because if you don't do that, uh, if you don't make it easy for the data producers to create data that fits your uh, needs, then you will end up with a situation where the product teams or the domain teams, they, they just try to bypass whatever you try to build for them. If it doesn't, if you, if you don't make it easy for them, then um, they will find their own way. And that means you have a pocket of Wild West happening, popping up in your entire organization everywhere. So it needs to be, again, it needs to be flexible, but rigid where needed, which means it needs to also be data standard that anyone can easily adhere to. Um, and this is complex to solve. Both of these are complex to solve. Um, and the, the final thing, the central governance teams becoming human bottlenecks, 
we really want to build a system and a process, uh, a mix of processes and tools, where you have strong guardrails, something to catch people uh, when the domain owners are actually trying to design their own data. So instead of uh, reviewing what they've designed after the fact or waiting for it to pop into your database, you want to build a system like a linter or something like that that confirms uh, while people are designing their data that it actually matches the guardrails that you are trying to enforce. Again, I know and realize that this is not easy. Um, and it's taken, um, it took us a really long time at QuizUp to build even uh, something that remotely sort of uh, uh, solved this uh, partially even, uh, but you can get a lot, you can get far, very far with a lot of sort of uh, minimalistic implementations. For example, you can build JSON schemas on your GitHub and you can add some linters there and you can build some code chain. Um, uh, obviously, I am here also as the CEO and co-founder of Avo and I wouldn't um, uh, have built Avo if I hadn't, uh, if I don't strongly believe that um, we can really make this easier. And that is why we've built Avo. And that is why we are lucky to have incredible customers uh, or teams at world class, world class data teams and product teams at companies like um, Fender and IKEA and Walt um, that actually make this possible uh, today uh, at their own teams by using our products. Um, so what we are now focusing on, though, in this coming year, and what I wanted to bring up here, um, is that we are taking this even 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 further this year. Um, we already support these incredible companies doing this. Uh, and in that journey, we've been working with some of our largest customers in uh, how can we build even more tools around global governance uh, and local or domain-oriented ownership uh, for the upstream data quality management. So if any of this resonates, I'd love to hear from you and uh, maybe we can help, um, uh, ideally. And maybe you'd be interested in becoming a design partner for our future focus. But in any case, I, uh, with that, would love to thank you for being with me here today. Um, if you want to learn more about Avo, you can go to avo.app. Uh, if you want to continue the conversation, which I always want to, reach out to me directly. I am uh, also on LinkedIn. Um, and Twitter, like some of us are still today. And you can also email me directly. So thank you so much, everyone. Exactly. You can also join uh, the Modern Data Stack, data stack chat um, uh, to continue the conversation because I know we're at time. And then uh, uh, we also have a Slack um, channel or conversation uh, community at AVO as well that you can find on our website. But um, I, um, uh, again, would love to continue the conversation also on LinkedIn. So. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you, everyone. And reach out also for that merch. I saw some interest in the merch.